Now, a couple of weeks ago, I uploaded a unboxing sort of initial impressions. Um, we did lots of different tests as well. So sort of sat different, you know, distances away, plosive tests, all of that sort of stuff, all unprocessed. Like I said, initial impressions, this microphone right here. This is the SE Electronics Dynacaster. This is their first broadcast dynamic microphone. It's got loads of really cool features built into it. It does come in at 225 pounds, but I think it's well priced for the quality that you get for that microphone. And today in this video, I'm gonna try my best because we know what I'm like for waffling on to keep this video short and sweet, but we are gonna do the top five reasons on why you would wanna buy this microphone for streaming, podcasting, YouTube videos, content creation, all of that sort of stuff. Zoom calls, Teams calls, all of those things that this microphone is awesome for. We're gonna break it down to your five categories and I'm gonna tell you what they are. Now, before we start with that, I think it's worth noting that in the original video, I was running completely unprocessed. I was also sat with my back the complete other way um, where I do get a little bit less reverb and things like that. Today is more of this sort of test if you're using it for streaming, you know, all of those sort of things, you know, where you're gonna have monitors in front of you, reflective PC case screens, all of that sort of stuff. This is gonna be a bit more of a worst case scenario. Also, I was running the microphone completely unprocessed in that video. I think I might've added a noise gate and that would have been about it. But on this video with the Revelator IO24, which I'm using today, I do have the processing turned on, okay? So I am putting in a high pass filter, a gate, a compressor, and some EQ, okay? So just to let you know about that. But it really is just a light bit of processing. I didn't wanna to get too heavy with this microphone. I do believe anyway when it comes to processing that less is more. Okay, so what are my five reasons then on why you should consider buying this microphone? Number one is that it is a dynamic microphone. Now, a dynamic microphone isn't going to sound as nice as a condenser microphone. You're not going to sound as open and airy. You're not going to sound as natural. It is going to have that sort of warm, broadcasty tone to it. So it's not going to be for everyone. But the problem is, I love condenser microphones. Okay, I'm just going to put that out there. I'd prefer one to use one over a dynamic but it doesn't work well for my environment. This is a massive room, there's loads of reflections, um, and even if I can control all of that, it's not just about the sound that you've got inside of your room, it's the sound outside of the room. If Jen is upstairs watching a TV, you know, and there's, the movie's a bit loud because we've got a sound bar, this microphone doesn't pick it up. I mean, I can even put the washing machine on next doors if I'm streaming, and you, you can't pick it up. By the time I've gated it, you don't even hear it. Same when I've got the kids in the house, they're running around, doesn't hear it, and that's great because when you're making content all the time and you're also working a full-time job, asking everyone to just be quiet for a few hours while you make a video, it's not really fair on people. Um, and that's where a condenser microphone really suffers. But like I said, they do sound better, but a dynamic microphone is gonna be better for most people for streaming, content creation. If you're you know, inside you know, a busy area that you live, you know, if your house is noisy or if it's noisy outside, all of that stuff, it's gonna massively improve stuff. Moving on to number two then. Well, I know this is gonna be a very controversial point, but the microphone does look good. And I know whenever you've got a budget for a microphone, whether it's a hundred pounds or a thousand pounds, you should buy the best sounding microphone for your use case with the money that you've got. But when you are gonna be streaming or you're gonna be putting out video to the internet where you're gonna be seen and all of your things are gonna be seen, then I do believe that the microphone does need to have a bit of a look to it. And I do believe this is a nice looking microphone. It's not as iconic as an SM7B, and I do think it looks, it doesn't look as nice as this little unit here, but I really like the compact size of it. It's nice and small. Look, here you go, RE320 in a Rode shock mount that I modified. Look at the size of the thing. It is an absolute weapon compared to this, and this is a nice, compact, dynamic microphone. It's very close to, like, condenser microphone size. It's, it looks similar in size to something like an AT2020, okay? Over to number three. A microphone can look very good, but if it's not built well, then there's no point in having it. And this microphone is built exceptionally well. And probably the best thing about the build quality of this microphone is the built-in pop filters. This is a three-in-one construction. This pop filter is awesome. I think there was a little P there and there was a little bit coming through, um, but it does such a good job with plosives. Okay, so on the outside and on the front, got to stop touching the microphone um there's this like red foam so that's your first layer of protection you can then unscrew the front and then there's one that's about a centimeter and a half like a foam pop filter just inside here and then there's also a little bit of foam on the capsule as well so that's your three and one pop filter and it also comes with this one that's on the floor because i'm reshooting this video and i think i probably just threw it in a rage 
It comes with a big foam pop filter as well. So that's essentially four in one protection that you've got going on um, with this microphone. So it doesn't matter how loud your plosives are, this microphone has certainly got you covered. Now four and five, we're gonna switch, mostly because I wanna do a bit of padding. Um, so we can make it five reasons why you would wanna buy this microphone. And also because we wanna talk about the pads and the center switch separately, okay? So either side of the center switch on this microphone, you have two switches that engage various sort of filters, essentially, okay? So the first one, the one that's closest to me, there's a high pass filter when it's down. When it's in the middle, it's flat, which is what I've got it set today with then a high pass filter applied afterwards. And then above that, there is also a bass boost switch, okay? Now the high pass filter is, you know, nothing new for a microphone, plenty of microphones have them and there's a fair few dynamic microphones that have them as well. But the high pass filter is gonna be really good if you've got a very bassy voice or if you've got a lot of rumbles and, you know, other sounds around you that you wanna try and cut out, okay? I always prefer to record without one and add it in afterwards. That's generally what I do, but it's great that it's there if you're putting something straight out live, okay? Now, the top filter is the bass boost one. Go and check out the other video where I test out all these switches because I'm not going to do it today. And I'm not a fan of the bass boost at all, okay? I think it makes you sound quite muddy um, for my voice anyway. But if you're someone that has a very thin voice that boosts a lot of those bass frequencies when you're processing afterwards, this could add a really nice, warm, rich tone to it. But the thing is, I normally boost somewhere between 100 and 120 hertz range, just a slight little boost there. Um, to get that sort of, you know, little bit more bass in my voice, you know, past the high pass after I've done the high pass filter. But this also boosts the bass regions around that sort of 250 to 500 hertz range. And that is somewhere where I don't really like to boost my voice. That is where I think my voice sounds very muddy. And Banju actually used this microphone, I think about just less than a week ago on one of his podcast videos where he talks about all the news and all of that stuff. And everyone was saying that the mic sounded really muddy and a bit boomy and he did have that switch engaged okay not to criticize because that guy knows far more than i know about microphones but yeah i think for most people you're probably not going to want to use that bass switch now for me it's the two switches on the other side that i like the reason i sold my sm7b is because it's far too dark in the top end i didn't like it i feel a lot of people buy that microphone because they want to get rid of sibilance and all of that sort of stuff but i think that s's are a very important frequency in your voice OK, that need to be there. Um, they're not going to be for everyone. And yes, it can be a little bit fatiguing over time. But the reason a lot of people buy Electro Voice RE320s and RE20s is because they almost have like a condenser like top end. That's what a lot of people say. I wouldn't say it's quite condenser like, but it gives you a little bit of bite, a little bit of sparkle in that top end. And this microphone has two switches to do that. So the first one is about a three and a half to four and a half dB boost. And the other one's a lot more aggressive. That's almost closer to a, like a 9 to 10 dB boost. I'm using the first one today, but then I also have a 1 dB high shelf that I've added in on top of it because I couldn't decide in the original video which one I like more. And I've decided I kind of want one right in the middle. So that's all I've done. I've just added it up, you know, one more dB. And I really like this. This is just makes it sound more natural to me. And you've still got that warmth and bottom end of a dynamic mic of a dynamic microphone, but you've just got a little bit of sparkle, a little bit of bite. Now, as much as you could add all of this afterwards in processing, I think these two switches are awesome because you can just shape the mic a little bit to how you want it to sound before you're putting it out live, okay? If you're not adding in filters, Zoom, Teams, those sort of things. And finally, number five then, that middle switch. So what does the middle switch do? Well, the middle switch activates the built-in dynamite um, to this microphone. That is actually what it's what it's got inside it. It's got an SC dynamite. If you don't know what a dynamite is and know what a fethead or a cloud lifter is, it's essentially the same thing. So it is going to enable the preamp on it, which means then you can put 48 volts of phantom power into this microphone and it gives you 30 dB of clean gain. Now, I will have to apologize. I was a little bit like, isn't this awesome? It's, it's great. They're the first people to do it um, in the last video. Totally forgot about the Aston Stealth. Um, I feel a little bit more annoyed that I screwed up there because I almost bought that microphone a year ago and was watching a lot of videos on it. So yeah, it must have just skipped my memory there. But this would probably be one of the a few microphones that has a built-in preamp in it. And there is a big debate on whether you need fat heads or cloud lifters or not. One debate is that a lot of preamps now can deliver between 55 and 60 dB of gain anyway. 
but sometimes they don't sound that good. I find that the Rodecaster that my friends got when we were setting all of that up and messing around with it, I found them to sound quite hissy um, when they were cranked right up, and he added fat heads to all of his Procasters that he plugged into. Have I said the right name? Rodecaster for the mixer, Procaster for the mic, and he added them because we found that it sounded quite hissy. A lot of people will say that you need 60 dB of gain for an SM7B. Well, I never had to put 60 dB to get it to that minus, you know, that negative 18 to negative 10 level. I was actually closer to 50. This with the preamp enabled, which is what I've got enabled today, I've only got 18 dB on the on the preamp and then the 30 dB. So it's only got 48 dB because you can boost all the audio up afterwards. The only time it's going to be a problem with those type of microphones, if you're in a live situation, and you don't have any way to boost it from the original signal that you've got in. Then there is a shout for using this sort of technology. But it's great that it's there. And the reason it's great that it's there is, like I said earlier, like I said, there's a lot of debate on this. So I don't want to get too into it. But let's just say that your preamp can only do 50 dB or 55 dB. And that's mostly what you need to get to the level that you need for your voice. But then it's really hissy. This is going to stop that. It's going to you know, massively reduce it down. And this is then opens you up to very cheaper audio interfaces. You could use this with like the cheapest Behringer, you know, really entry level um, audio interfaces, maybe like the Personas Audio Box, which is a great, they're great audio interfaces that I'm talking about here. But the things that just don't have that last bit of meat that you need, you could pair it with this microphone. So it's £225 on a mic. You could just literally pair it with a £40 audio interface, turn on 48 volts of phantom power. And you've got good sound. So, you know, it saves you some money there that you can then buy a nicer audio interface afterwards. But I am someone that believes that just because it's got the features, it still needs to sound within its price category. I still can't decide which microphone I like more, but I like I like both. And I do believe that the Dynacaster is a microphone that sounds in the 200 to 200, 300 pound price category. So the fact that it's got all of that stuff is a massive bonus. I would really love to see one without the dynamite built in that they could price at like 150 pounds because i feel like that microphone would yeah it would sell a lot of units a lot more units i did say in the original video both this microphone and the re320 suffer from that awkward price point because you're often going to buy either a pod mic or an sm7b you just do that jump you don't buy the thing that's in the middle and it's not these microphones fault it's just how people buy stuff and i think that needs to change um, I thoroughly have enjoyed using this microphone and I'm definitely going to be using it a lot more on the channel. Um, I think I'm going to use this one a bit more for my streaming. Things where I'm doing it a bit longer, that is where I'm going to use this, this microphone for, for sort of longer stuff. Even though I said I'll try and keep this video short and sweet, I haven't. Because I have come to the point that I think the RE320 is a bit too fatiguing. Um, it's okay for a quick three or four minute video, but anything longer. It's sharp and this one is just about right. But anyway, that's my waffling at the end of the video. I always like people just to listen to it and tell me what you think of it. It's hard to assess your own voice because your voice sounds different. You know, it sounds different in headphones and all that sort of stuff. So I'm just interested in what your thoughts, what your opinions are. Would you consider buying this microphone or have you been looking at something else? Huge thanks to SE Electronics for sending it out to me. I hope you like all the content that I've done on it. Um, I'll be back with some more videos very soon. Make sure you subscribe. Um, if you like the video, leave a like. If you dislike it, leave a dislike and I'll be back with some more content real soon.